Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to start taking your seats, we'll uh, start now because we're just running a, a wee bit over time. Well, listen, uh, thank you very much for taking your seats. As I say, we're slightly over time, but um, we want to give you a full hour with Dan. Uh, my name is James Kingston. I'm here because, first and foremost, because I'm Simon's cousin, but also <laughs> because, as well as that, I'm legal advisor in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and Dan asked me to introduce my friend and colleague to you, Dan Mulhall. Um, and just to say, it's great to be back in West Cork for the first West Cork History Festival. Now, Dan is a man of many parts. He's a poet, he's a historian, a diplomat, and a prolific tweeter. Um, he served in the Department of Foreign Affairs over, I think, coming up to four decades in a wide variety of roles at home and abroad. In recent years, he and his wife, Greta, have served uh, in Ireland's first consul. Dan was the first consul general in Edinburgh, I think, in 1988. He then went to be ambassador in Kuala Lumpur and covered a wide uh, range of countries in that region, and one of his duties included actually travelling towards the tsunami to help Irish citizens there. After that, he returned to headquarters in Dublin, where we first started working close together when Dan was Director General of European Affairs in the department. And we worked over a period of years in the negotiations on what became the Lisbon Treaty, and then during not one but two, two folks, uh, referendum on that treaty which uh, enabled its ratification. After that Dan returned to the field as our ambassador in Berlin at a particularly difficult time for our country and he played a major role in restoring Ireland's reputation in Germany and further afield uh, over a period of time when his interlocutors included not only Angela Merkel but Jedward. Um, <laughs> After Berlin, Dan moved in 2013 to London with Greta, and he has represented Ireland and Ireland's interests at a period where, notwithstanding our excellent and ever closer bilateral relations, uh, we, are facing, we have had a particularly difficult time uh, in the run-up to and in the aftermath of the Brexit uh, referendum. And Dan has played an important role both in representing Ireland in Britain and also in explaining Britain to those of us back in Dublin. And even in the age of tweeting and multimedia and so on, there is still a role, I think, for personal diplomacy in improving international bilateral relationships. Anyway, Dan is shortly heading to Washington, where I've no doubt he will continue to bring his own unique uh, skills to bear in representing Ireland in the United States during what will no doubt be a particularly interesting, in the Chinese sense of the word, uh, period ahead. Uh, so with that, I'll now hand over to Dan, who's going to speak to us about two notable Irish writers, Francis Ledwidge and A.E. George Russell. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind of you to, to come for um, this event, and uh, it's great to be introduced and uh, welcomed here to West Cork by a colleague who has a uh, strong West Cork Connections. I'm a Waterford man myself, so on the 13th of August uh, there'll be a bit of rivalry between uh, Waterford and Cork, but we won't talk about that today. I'm here to talk about the past, not the future. Okay? Um, anyway, um, you may ask, uh, why am I at a history festival talking about two writers? It seems like a strange thing to do. Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. And the first is because while I'm a historian, I don't have time to do archival research. So the great thing about writers is that they, they publish stuff and you can read what they have to say for themselves in published form and means that I can go on to A books and I can, I can buy the books I want to read and I can read them in the comfort of my home. Normally about 11 o'clock at night when I've come home from an event I tend to spend an hour or two doing some kind of what I call research, others mightn't, but anyway I, that's how I kind of um, keep myself, um, that's how I get my sources together. So. Um, but I'm also, I've always been interested in the, this interaction between history and literature, particularly in Ireland between, say, 1890 and 1930, because that was a time when Ireland was transformed politically, but perhaps not coincidentally, it was also a time when we produce a crop of extraordinary writers, 
Just think about it. W.B. Yeats, Singh, Wilde, Shaw, Beckett, you know, O'Casey, Joyce. All these writers came from a small island on the western edge of Europe, all emerged at roughly the same time, within the same time frame, and became major global literary figures. So I've always wondered, believed that there was some connection between the fact that Ireland went through this period of turbulence and political change on the one hand, and the fact that we produced such extraordinary writers at that time. And of course, you need not go very far in Ireland to appreciate the overlap between history and literature. All you've got to do is think of Yeats's great poem, Easter 1916, which is, in a way, an indispensable source now for the understanding of 1916. I'm not saying you can understand the entire thing from reading Yeats's poem, of course not. But it does give you a very fine introduction in about a couple of minutes it takes to read the poem to the complexities of that period, because it is a poem of ambivalence. It's not a it's not a poem of a cheerleader for the rising, nor is it a critic of the rising. It's someone who believes that the rising was a terrible beauty. In other words, that it had its terrible aspects and aspects of beauty. And that, I think, is a mature way of looking at the rising. I think when I was growing up in Waterford in the 1950s and 60s at school with the Christian Brothers, we were, in, we were urged to focus on, on the beauty, on, this, on the beautiful... Um, sacrificial, um, selfless uh, efforts of those who fought and who led the Easter Rising. And then later on, during the Troubles in Northern Ireland in particular, people tended to focus more on the, you know, the violent element and, and the terrible nature of violence, including uh, insurrectionary violence of the kind that occurred in Dublin in, in 1916. And I hope that now that we've reached the centenary of those turbulent events, that we can now look at Yeats's analysis in both of its aspects, a terrible beauty. So today I'm going to talk about two lesser known writers, George Russell and Francis Ledwidge. Now, you may ask, what's the connection between them? Well, there's a funny little connection between them in that. Around 1914 or thereabouts, uh, when Ledwidge had become uh, a member of the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers. Um, George Russell A. met um, Ledwidge's mentor, Lord Dunsany, who was a local aristocrat in County Meath, who took um, Ledwidge under his wing and promoted him as a poet, and very successfully and very well and with great um, commitment to uh, advancing Ledwidge's literary career. Got him published in various places where a poet from County Meath at that time, with no education, no family background, couldn't have expected to get into prestigious British publications. But Dunsany arranged for uh, Ledwidge to be published and his talent to be recognised uh, by the wider literary community. Anyway, George Russell, A.E., met Dunsany and said to him, Tut, tut, your man Ledwidge, he borrowed five pounds from me and never paid it back. I wanted to let you know the kind of person you're promoting now. Now, we know that apparently then the debt was paid pretty quickly, no doubt, uh, possibly uh, Dunsany himself uh, advanced the money to Ledwidge, who then paid back the bearded George Russell. We know that Russell was inclined to um, uh, have writers in his debt because in, in Ulysses we discover that um, Leopold Bloom owed money to George Russell, A.E., which probably means that James Joyce owed money to A.E., almost certainly. He owed money to a lot of people, so I'm sure A.E. was one of those. And that's why A.E. appears in Ulysses as A.E.I.O.U. <laughs> so, so, uh, so there is that connection between uh, Ledwidge and Russell. So let me just talk about Russell, first of all, because this is the 150th anniversary of George Russell's birth. He was born in, in Lurgan in, in County Armagh in um, 1867. So born in the year of the Fenian Rising. He moved to Dublin when he was a, a young man, a, a teenager. He was 12 years of age when he moved to Dublin. And 
shortly afterwards, he was at art school in Dublin and he met William Butler Yeats. And the two men developed a, a lifelong friendship, which was not always very easy because they tended to get on each other's um, nerves in that um, um, he was a very democratic, uh, very collegial kind of individual who liked to cultivate young writers and, and build a kind of a coterie around him. Yeats was rather more imperious. Also in his later years, Yeats became this kind of aristocratic nationalist and flirted with authoritarianism, whereas Russell was a great admirer of James Connolly. So he was a man of the left, whereas uh, Yeats's instincts were more uh, to the right of the political spectrum. So they often had a kind of a strained relationship. But nonetheless, they, they remained friends to the end of Russell's life. Russell died in 1935 in, in Bournemouth. Now, Russell, when Yeats met him, was a, was a visionary. He was one of these people, he had lots of hair, he walked around more or less heads in the cloud and wrote poems and, and um, was a, a very fine uh, painter of mystical scenes. So he literally had visions, mystical visions. And his poetry, his early poetry, in fact, throughout his life, his poetry is essentially mystical, spiritual, in the extreme. Even his, uh, his name, A.E., comes from Aeon, which is a Gnostic um, uh, you know, word for the you know, original beings and so on. So he was a, the ultimate uh, mystic. So what happened to him? Well, a strange thing happened to him. In 1897, when he was working in Pym's department store, he was a, he was a clerk in a, in a Dublin department store. And, you know, he was then, at night, he was painting and writing these and going off to Donegal and communing with nature and literally having, ha having visions. And he met Horace Plunkett. And at that time, Plunkett was trying to establish the um, Irish cooperative movement. And he liked Russell. He thought he was someone he could use. So he appointed him as a bank's organiser and sent him off to the west of Ireland. So this mystic, bearded mystic, strange religious beliefs, he was a theosophist, it was one of the New Age religions of the late 19th century, got onto his bicycle and cycled round the more remote parts of the west of Ireland, Connemara. And this gave Russell a lifelong understanding of the fact that rural Ireland in those days wasn't this idyllic place, but it was a very poor and economically deprived place. And he developed a strong practical streak because he saw for himself the living conditions in the west of Ireland. And he came to believe that the way forward for Ireland was through cooperation, through people working together to create a proper civilization that could then be the basis for an independent Ireland with a strong, dynamic, and vibrant culture. So he was very concerned with the material basis of Ireland's future development. One of the few people of that era, in fact, who, who thought about the economics of independence. Russell was one of those. In 1905, um, Plunkett decided that he could use Russell's skills in Dublin as the editor of the Irish Homestead, which was the weekly publication of the Irish Agricultural Organisation Society, which Plunkett had founded, to drive the cooperative movement. And for the next 25 years of his life, Russell was the editor of a weekly magazine. And he wrote articles, and you have to read these sometime, get out a selection of Russell's contributions to the Irish homestead. He had articles about literary subjects. In fact, he published James Joyce's first short stories, which became part of Dubliners. Joyce didn't thank him very much. He um, referred to the Irish homestead disparagingly as the pig's paper, which it was, although the pigs didn't read it, but it was meant to... Uh, and, of course, Russell wrote articles not just about the literary revival or, you know, the reawakening of the ancient fires in Ireland and the gods had descended from the heavens and had, had stationed themselves in the Irish mountains and were going to transform the country. That was part of his mystical philosophy. But he also wrote about the quality of manure and about butter and about raising poultry and about all these 
incredibly practical things, from the spiritual to the agricultural, with an emphasis, by the way, on the agricultural. And you read these and you say, how could a man of his background and literary interests have... But he did. He contented himself with writing these very basic instructional articles designed to instruct farmers in the virtues of agricultural improvement. So a very realistic and, and practical man. Now in 1913, he strongly took the side of the workers during the lockout of that year. And he spoke passionately in favour of the workers. And he criticised the Irish Parliamentary Party, the employers and the church. He was a brave man in early 20th century Ireland who was willing to take on the bishops, the party, the most powerful political party Ireland had ever had, and the business community. But Russell did that. And he, he said that the attitudes of the employers in Dublin, led by William Martin Murphy, more of him later, was going to make industrial civilization stir like a quaking bog. So he felt that civilization was going to be completely wrecked if the employers didn't treat their workers more humanely. It's a very strong appeal on behalf of Dublin's workers in, in 1913. And he also got to know James Connolly, and in one of his poems, he referred to James Connolly as my man. And in fact, Connolly appointed Russell as his executor to look after his family following Connolly's execution. And Russell did try to help the family raise money for them and try to get them uh, a visa to go to North America, but the British government wouldn't allow it because they felt that Connolly's widow would just stir up trouble for them among the Irish in America at that time. Now, Francis Ledwich, very different background. Born in Slane in County Meath, 1887. Born into, his father was a, a farm labourer. He grew up in a farm labourer's cottage. The father died young as Tragedy tended to, happen, tend to happen in those days and left a big family with the wife having to look after them. So then his mother spent many years literally working in the fields to earn a pittance to keep the family going. But Ledwich had a, left school at uh, 13, just had primary schooling, but was always scribbling poems. And as I said, he managed to attract the attention and support of um, Lord Dunsany. Now, Ledwidge is kind of like an identikit early 20th century radical Irish nationalist because he was an enthusiast for the revival of the Irish language, in other words, a supporter of the Gaelic League, which was the, the sort of um, incubator of nationalism in early 20th century Ireland. Most of those who led the Easter Rising were brought into public life and political activity through their commitment to the Irish language and its revival. Ledwidge was also, he played Gaelic football, but he also played cricket, by the way, so the two things were not incompatible. But he was an enthusiast for Gaelic games. Through Dunsany, he became part of the Irish literary revival and got to know Pierce, McDonough, Yeats, uh, George Russell and so forth. He was also a labour activist. He organised a strike among the miners in County Meath in the second decade of the 20th century. He was a member of the local authority. As a very young man, he was elected to the local authority. So obviously he was someone who was recognised locally as having particular talents, although he worked in a series of fairly menial jobs. And then finally, he was the secretary of the local branch of the Irish Volunteers, set up in 1913 as part of the struggle to secure home rule for Ireland. Now, when the war broke out, and John Redmond argued that the duty of Irish men was to enlist to fight for Ireland on the battlefields of the Western Front, a majority of the volunteers said, yes, we agree with Redmond, we'll go along with that policy. A minority said, no, 
the duty of the volunteers is to stay in Ireland and defend Ireland from invasion and be ready to fight for Ireland when the time comes at home, not abroad. Now, you would expect, from what I said about Ledwidge's background, that he would have been one of the minority who opposed Redmond and favoured the more radical option of staying at home. And indeed he did. Because when the volunteers met in Slane, in County Meath, in 1914, to discuss what they would do, follow Redmond or not, Ledwidge was in a small minority of those who said, no, we're not going to follow Redmond, we're going to stay in Ireland, we're going to refuse to enlist in the British Army. So, and in fact, Ledwidge then attended a meeting of the local authority, the Navan Rural Council, of which he was a member, and he objected to a resolution condemning those who opposed Redmond, and he, Ledwidge, insisted that those who went against Redmond and argued for staying at home and defending Ireland in Ireland, he said they were the true patriots. And then he was accused of being pro-German, and his answer was, I'm anti-German and an Irishman, he said. But then he said, echoing the traditional nationalist viewpoint here, he said, Ireland's, sorry, England's uprise has always been Ireland's downfall. And that is the corollary, the um, counterpart to England's difficulty, Ireland's opportunity. So Redmond then, oh, sorry, um, Ledwidge was very definitely took the line against the advice of John Redmond, the leader of the Irish party. And then five days later, he enlisted in the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers and spent the next three years of his life in British uniform. It's a great puzzle. Now, he seems to have been quite adept at soldiering because after some months of training in Dublin and in Hampshire, he fought in Gallipoli and he fought in Serbia. And he was, he was injured during the campaign in Serbia. This is a very severe campaign, and bad winter, and he ended up convalescing, first of all in Egypt, and then in Manchester. And he was in Manchester, had just been discharged from hospital, Easter week 1916, when he heard about the Easter Rising. And as I said, everything in Ledwidge's background would say he ought to have been fighting in Dublin in 1916. And sure enough, he was shaken by the news of the Rising and also of the execution of the leaders and most particularly his good friend Thomas McDonough, fellow poet. And he wrote, still a member of the British Army, by the way, he wrote the following lines, expressing his admiration for the Easter Rising and its leaders. A noble failure is not vain, but hath a victory of its own. For mine are all the dead men's dreams. So he identified with the dreams of those who had organized the Easter Rising and who had been executed as a result. His most famous poem is a poem dedicated to the memory of Thomas McDonough with the famous lines, he shall not hear the bittern cry in the wild sky where he is lain, nor voices of the sweeter birds above the wailing of the rain. Yet, even though he was deeply affected by the rising and felt conflicted by being a sympathizer with the rising's ideals and also a member of the British Army, he was disenchanted, but he returned to the front in December 1916. And what I find from reading his letters back from the front is, despite his disappointment with what happened in Dublin in 1916 in this aftermath, and his affinity with the men of 1916, 
it was his stoicism and his determination to continue the fight. In other words, it wasn't a case of he was a good soldier and then 1916 changed everything. 1916 changed a lot for him, but it didn't change his ultimate conviction. And for example, he wrote to the poet Catherine Tynan in January 1917 and said, and I quote, I am a unit in the great war, doing and suffering, admiring great endeavor and condemning great dishonor. I may be dead before this reaches you, but I will have done my part. He expresses homesickness for County Meath perennially in his correspondence, but there's also a certain excitement about being involved in this um, huge and tragic conflict. So even though he was disenchanted by the rising and its aftermath and the treatment of the leaders, he still felt that he was playing his part, doing the right thing. In June 1917, a month before his death, he wrote that he was not without hope that a new Ireland will arise from her ashes in the ruins of Dublin, like the phoenix, with one purpose, one aim, and one ambition. But then he suggested that, quote, every honour won by Irish men on the battlefields of the world was Ireland's honour, and does it not tend to the glory and delight of her posterity? So even in 1917, he was still committed to the idea that there was glory to be won for Ireland on the battlefields of the Western Front. He believed, despite what had happened the year before in Dublin, that service on the battlefields of World War I was still the right thing to do. He was killed on the 31st of July on, during the Third Battle of Ypres when a German shell exploded beside him and blew him to bits. He's buried in the Artillery Wood Cemetery, not far from the grave of the Welsh language poet Hedwin, who was killed that very same day and whose home I recently visited in North Wales. A very nice uh, thing to do because of connection with Ledridge and the people there are very, very conscious of the fact that two, two budding, aspiring young poets were killed on the same day, on the same battlefield in that tragic conflict. Now, to go back to George Russell, in 1917, George Russell was busy, very busy. Because after the Easter Rising, Russell became convinced that Ireland was headed for trouble. He could see that things had changed, that the Irish party had lost its way, had lost the sympathy of the Irish people, that allegiance had been transferred to a new generation of people who were the heirs and inheritors of the 1916 tradition. And Russell believed that his role was to try to come up with compromises. He was essentially a pragmatist who thought there must be a solution to this unionist nationalist problem. And he worked very hard at trying to concoct uh, proposals that might resolve the problems of Ireland. And in 1917, he published a pamphlet called Thoughts for a Convention. This was in advance of the convention the Irish Convention of 1917, established by the British government in a last-ditch attempt to reconcile different opinions in Ireland. And basically, Russell's view was that nationalists and unionists could be reconciled in a self-governing Ireland within the empire. And he argued strongly to Ulster unionists that a Dublin government, a Dublin parliament, would never do anything to damage the economic interests of Ulster and its industry and, and its industrial strengths. So Russell was invited to take part in the convention. Here you have a poet and the editor of a newspaper invited to take part in this convention which brought together 95 people from all parts of Ireland, all traditions. The reason Russell was invited was because Sinn Féin boycotted the convention, Wouldn't, didn't want to be involved in it. Everyone else got involved. Uh, Sinn Féin, led by De Valera at that time, didn't want to be involved. So the, the British government needed a few people to, who, could, who could articulate the views of the advanced nationalists of the Sinn Féin movement. And they chose George Russell as someone who could, was familiar with the thinking of Sinn Féin, even though he wasn't a supporter of theirs, but he could at least explain their point of view and could, could in some way represent their interests. 
And Russell's priority was not that there should be a republic or sovereignty for Ireland. There were practical concerns. He wanted Ireland, a self-governing Ireland, a dominion along the lines of Canada or Australia, wanted Ireland to have control of taxation. For him, that was the key thing. Control of taxation and control of trade. And everything else he was willing to cede to the imperial parliament. In other words, defence, foreign policy, all those things. But the key thing was control of economic policy so Ireland could make a new destiny for itself based on its own efforts and based on the cooperative principle, which he strongly uh, advocated. Now, now, the solutions, the compromises that Russell came up with at the Irish Convention gained the support of two groups who had previously been Russell's great opponents. The bishops who were represented on the Irish Convention, they supported Russell's compromise proposals because they would have avoided conflict and revolutionary turmoil. And then, most curiously of all, William Martin Murphy, whom George Russell had demonized and had regarded as the ultimate scoundrel in 1913 because of his attitude towards the workers at that time, he also supported Russell. So you have this curious alliance of Southern Unionists, led by Lord Middleton, um, the Irish Party, led by Redmond, George Russell, some Southern business people, the Irish bishops, and William Martin Murphy representing uh, the workers of Dublin and the country's economic interest, all behind the same proposal put forward by, uh, written by George Russell. So Russell, as he put it at one stage, he said, quote, there is going to be wild weather through the world. This is in the aftermath of the first, this was as the first world war was coming to an end. There's going to be wild weather in the world. And we want an Irish captain and an Irish crew in charge of the Irish ship. So he clearly thought that self-government was essential for Ireland, but not the ultimate goal of a republic. He was willing to see Ireland a self-governing dominion within the empire with control of taxation and trade. In 1917, December 1917, he made the most eloquent and passionate appeal for compromise between nationalist and unionist ideals. He argued for a setting aside of arguments about the past. He felt that the nationalist and unionist points of view were too obsessed with the past and needed to think about the future that could be created in Ireland. And he, he had a kind of a, kind of a stock analysis of the contrast between nationalism and Ulster unionism. And, you know, but it was, it was probably quite typical for the time but he said that the two traditions, he said, had much to learn from each other. Nationalists could learn from unionists, quote, a practical efficiency in the affairs of life. While unionists could acquire from nationalists, quote, that idealism and love of beauty, which has blossomed in a thousand songs. So here you have the stereotype of the, the Irish nationalists with their flair for poetry and, and music and the practical northern unionist who was good at making things. So you had the unionists good at making things and the nationalists good at making things up. <laughs> anyway, um, now, as if to underline his argument about the unity of Irish national character, he appended a poem to his essay in the Irish Times. It was a very long essay published by the Irish Times in December 1917, an appeal for unity. And this poem had a terrible title. I mean, really, somebody should have, a sub-editor should have got at him and uh, done something about this. But it's called, To the Memory of Some I Knew Who Are Dead and Who Loved Ireland. Not exactly Easter 1916 or anything like that. But it was a poem ahead of its time because it paid tribute to Pierce, to Connolly, to McDonough, to Constance Markovitz, but also to Willie Redmond, who died in June 1917 in the Western Front. It paid tribute to Tom Kettle, the Irish Nationalist MP 
who was killed at the Somme in 1916, and a man called Alan Anderson, who was the son of one of his colleagues in the cooperative movement. So he, he paid tribute to both sides of what became a divide in Ireland between those who fought in the First World War and those who fought in the Easter Rising. Russell tried to accommodate both of them in a single poem, which now we would see as a normal thing to do. But in 1917, it was far from normal because already there was a kind of distinction being developed between those who fought for independence in Ireland and those who fought on the Western Front. And then in the poem's concluding verse, he wrote optimistically about, quote, the confluence of dreams that clash together in our night. One river born of many streams roll on in one blaze of blinding light. So he, he somehow thought that all of these dreams that were around the place in Dublin and on, the, and on the Western Front could somehow become a confluence of dreams and they could roll on in one blaze of blinding light. Now, sadly, that didn't happen, but you'd have to admire him for his determination and the effort he made in 1917 to bring this about. So when he resigned from the convention. He resigned because he realised that neither the British government nor the Ulster Unionists were going to accept the kind of compromise solution that Russell thought could work. This was a self-governing dominion within the British Empire with special concessions and special arrangements for Northern Ireland. And he wrote, I think nothing but the most determined opposition to British government in Ireland would have any effects on that government. A man must either be an Irishman or an Englishman in this matter, I am Irish. So here you have someone from a, a northern Church of Ireland background, a mystical poet, someone who was sought to be non-political because of his role in the cooperative movement, finally in 1917 declaring himself in sympathy with those who took a strong line about the need to oppose what he considered to be an incorrect policy being pursued by the British government. So what Russell's story tells us is the lure of the Irish independence movement, which attracted people like Russell. He was a pacifist, after all. He's a lifelong pacifist, a vegetarian, a spiritualist, a, a mystic from a, from a Church of Ireland background in Northern Ireland. And yet he was drawn into this situation of quite strong support for the independence struggle. In a letter to Lloyd George, he wrote to Lloyd George, who was then Prime Minister, to explain his position and said, quote, and this is, I think, really quite prophetic. Remember, this was, 19, this was February 1918, so very early in the piece. The War of Independence was still in the future. The there was still a fair chance that the Irish party might have won the election after the war. They didn't win it, of course, but they might have won it. He said, we have for the first time in Ireland a disinterested nationalism not deriving its power from grievances connected with land or even oppressive government, but solely from the growing self-consciousness of nationality. And this has, with the younger generation, all the force of religion. It's a very powerful insight into the Ireland of 1918. He concluded that any government, quote, which does not allow this national impulse free play will be wrecked by it. So he was warning Lloyd George that there's a new form of nationalism now taking root in Ireland and it cannot be satisfied with home rule. It needs something more than home rule to satisfy it. Now, finally, the legacies of these two men, both of whom are undervalued, but I think both deserve the greater attention that they're receiving this year because of the anniversary of Russell's birth, which I have commemorated by giving a talk at the National Library there in uh, April, which is available on the embassy's website. Um, and Ledgewich is getting a lot of attention at the moment as well. His centenary is actually next Monday. Uh, and I'll be tweeting um, on my Twitter account uh, um, 
selections of Leonard Richards' poems over the weekend, so, you know, watch out for that. Tell your friends. So Leonard Richards' life was cut tragically short before he reached his 30th birthday. So we have no way of knowing what he might have been like had he survived the war. Now, when you think about it, Yeats was 30 in 1895. And you think the way Yeats was writing in 1895. Now, he was a better poet than Ledwidge, clearly. But think of how Yeats's poetry developed between 1895 and 1935 when he was writing his great final magisterial poems among school children and so forth, and the circus animals' desertion. So, therefore, you think, well, what would have happened to Ledwidge? He was only 30, after all. He was an apprentice poet. My question is, had he survived the war... Would his experiences during the war have caused him to reflect on the war and see life and his poetry in a different way from the way he saw it before the war when he was known as the poet of the blackbirds? Also, had he survived the war, given his background as a soldier of the Great War and a fervent admirer of the leaders of the Easter Rising, how would he have reacted to the War of Independence, to the Civil War, and to the new state that was created in 1922? We, do, uh, we can never know. But the evidence of his letters certainly suggests that he genuinely thought he had much bigger things to offer once the war came to an end. And sadly, we never got to see whether he could actually deliver on that promise. But he was certainly determined. He realized that his poetry had a long way to go. And therefore, it's possible he was young enough to have perhaps developed a new voice. He clearly had a talent. His talent was flawed. His poetry doesn't quite reach the heights. It's good, but it's not at the highest level. But perhaps with the experience of war and then the war of independence and the civil war, maybe he would have been able to respond to it in the way Yeats did not perhaps at the level achieved by Yeats, but I think he could have been a significant writer had he survived uh, the war. As to why Ledwidge, who was a left-leaning nationalist, why did he end up in British uniform? My own sense is that perhaps James Stevens, the poet and writer James Stevens, who met Ledwidge in the period before the war, he described him as a lump of a lad, so he was clearly someone who was physically quite strong and brave, and he'd, he'd worked in a series of quite tough physical jobs. He genuinely appears to have been stung by those in the local council, fellow nationalists, who accused him of being pro-German and a coward for not wanting to do his duty on the Western Front. So my sense is that he was someone who... It was a close call for him, perhaps, but he made the call. And then once he made the call, even though the Easter Rising intervened and shocked him greatly, he never changed his essential commitment to doing what he thought was his duty. As he put it later, he said, quote, I joined the British Army because she stood between Ireland and an enemy common to our civilization. And I would not have had her say that she defended us, in other words, Britain defended us, while we did nothing at home but pass resolution. So he clearly saw himself as a man of action. And in his, in his poetry and in his, um, in his letters home, you can see he has a certain kind of military ethos about him. He's not your um, effete um, nature poet. He's a, he's a fairly tough individual who understands the risks he's taking but believes it needs to be done. So 100 years after his death, it seems to me there's no longer any need to view Ledwidge as Seamus Heaney did in 1980 in his poem in memory, uh, in, in memory of Francis Ledwidge. Heaney described him as our dead enigma because he was an Irish nationalist who died in British uniform. A century on from those tragically troubled and turbulent times in Ireland and across the world, we are, I think, now more comfortable about the idea of an Irish man in what Heaney called Tommy's uniform, ghosting the trenches, even as we recognize 
how uncomfortable it must have been for many of them, especially in the aftermath of the Easter Rising of 1916. As for George Russell, he flourished in the post-war period, but not in the way that Yeats did or Ledwidge might have done as a poet. The dramatic events that gripped and transformed Ireland in the half decade after 1916 drew no poetic response from Russell. He's, after the, the poem I referred to there about the Easter Rising in the First World War, there's hardly any poem about anything other than his dreams and his mystical sense of the world. So he never wrote about the War of Independence or the Civil War or the Ireland that emerged in the way that Yeats did, so brilliantly. But what Russell did was something, I think, equally important. He became an astute, diligent, and pragmatic commentator on the affairs of Ireland as it made its way towards independence and in the first decade of Irish independence. So as the Irish Free State was getting on its feet, Russell edited the Irish Statesman, which if you read it now, it's probably the finest magazine to have been published in Ireland during the 20th century. The incredibly fine piece of journalism. And Russell was the driving force behind that magazine for the best part of a decade. He was supportive of the Commonwealth government at the time. He was opposed to the Republicans. He thought the Civil War had been a travesty. But he also gave space to people with conflicting viewpoints. For example, uh, Mary McSweeney, who was a very sharp, determined Republican, w was, you know, was able to contribute pieces to the Irish Statesman, although Russell would not have agreed with her views. So as the 20s wore on, um, George Russell experienced the kind of disenchantment that affected Yeats and many other writers of that period. He was dismayed in particular by the imposition of literary censorship in the 1920s. Although, as a left-leaning individual, he never flirted with the, author with the authoritarian tendencies and the aristocratic nationalism that was part of Yeats' response to the Ireland of his time. Francis Ledwidge once wrote that, quote, A.E. sets me thinking of things long forgotten. Well, his poetry certainly would um, give you that impression. Obviously, Ledwidge wasn't that familiar with um, with uh, George Russell's more down-to-earth um, uh, prose and journalism. He was only um, familiar with his poetry. So my own view is that both writers and their contrasting experience in 1917 deserve to be remembered. They both form part of what A.E. called that confluence of dreams a century ago that welled around Ireland and the battlefields of the Western Front, and that helped to make Ireland what it is today. And I certainly, over the last four years in London, I have been very concerned to, to commemorate all aspects of Irish history. And you know, last year, there were two days in particular when I did a, a Psalm commemoration in the morning and an Easter Rising commemoration in the evening. And I didn't feel any sense of awkwardness or strangeness about that experience. It seemed to me part of a, a mature reflection on the interconnected histories of our islands. I know there were those who, say a couple of years ago, thought that there was going to be some downplaying of the Easter Rising and its legacy and an upplaying of the First World War, its contribution to Ireland. I have striven to respect and reflect both of those strands. I have no doubt in my mind, but that the, the central narrative of Irish history runs through the General Post Office, the War of Independence, and so forth, on to 1922. But there are ancillary strands, and Ledwidge reflects in a very intriguing way, I think, one of those strands, because he was a fervent Irish nationalist. All indications from his background 
if you didn't know how it ended up, you would assume that he would have ended up as one of the those involved in Dublin during Easter week 1916. And the fact that he ended up dying at the Battle of Passchendaele on the 31st of July 1917 makes him a representative of those tens of thousands of Irish men who died in similar circumstances but who haven't left the kind of record behind that Ledwich has left as a poet, as a writer. But his record, what he, what he, what he left behind is again, it's a bit like Yeats's Eastern 1916. It's ambivalent. And I have no problem with ambivalence, and I hope you don't either. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Listen, Dan, thank you very much. That was an absolutely fascinating talk about two Irish writers who, as you say, both deserve greater recognition. Time is a little bit against us, and we must not miss either our lunch or the launch of the Skibbereen and District Historical Society Journal. But if we could take, perhaps, two questions, and then we can continue discussion over lunch. Okay, so I see... Professor Roy Foster there, I think, in the court. Can I, I take the first one, please? Um, I have a, a great interest in Francis Ledwidge, and first of all, I would like to thank Dan for a very, very intriguing talk on both Russell and Ledwidge. As I say, I have a very, very interest in Ledwidge. I am the son of a young officer under whom Ledwidge fought in Passchendaele, and in fact saw Ledwidge being killed by the shell that came over and took him out. Um, I would hope that as we approach the centenary of Ledger's death, which is next Monday, that the memorial to Ledger in Bozing is in a better state today than it was last September uh, when I and others uh, visited. Um, and that uh, memorial is, is approximately 150 metres from where Ledger is buried in Artillery Wood Cemetery. Um, and for, just for the commercial side of it, Ledger is not forgotten. I'm a part of a group in Bandon uh, which commemorates the uh, Great War. Um, next Monday will be the centenary of the opening day of the Third Battle of Ypres, or the Battle in the Mud, as Passchendaele was known as. And at 7 o'clock on that evening, there will be a commemoration at the or memorial in Bandon, and Ledger on that day will not be forgotten. But well, my little question, I think, to Dan was, and I was intrigued by Ledger's, insofar as that, why did he join a northern regiment? Um, my father had no option. He was commissioned to the, uh, the 5th Battalion of the Connacht Rangers, and he was seconded to the Royal Indian Skill and Fusiliers. But uh, Ledger's could quite easily have joined the local regiment in the recruiting area, which was the Leinsters. And it always kind of intrigued me, why did he join the Royal Indian Skill and Fusiliers? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, the answer is I don't know. I, I, I haven't uh, been able to delve into that uh, aspect of, of Ledwidge's um, life. But the one thing I would say is that it seems to have been a, a fairly quick decision. I mean, after all, on day one, he was standing up in the Navin Board of Guardians and expressing sentiments that would have suggested he ought to be on the road to 1916 to the Easter Rising. And then five days later, he was um, signing up for service in that uh, regiment. So my sense is that something, you know, took off in his mind and, and perhaps, perhaps he, didn't, uh, he didn't think it through, perhaps, and, and maybe it was an instinctive, just a kind of a snap decision. It must have been a snap decision, I mean, to... To go from, from essentially saying um, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity or the reverse um, one day and then five days later to sign up to fight on the, on the Western Front suggests to me that he had some kind of, uh, of crisis of conscience and this prompted him to, um, to sign up. And uh, he seems to have signed up at Richmond Barracks in Dublin, so it may, have been, it may be that he didn't make any careful plan about where he would sign up, um, uh, and um, he, uh, he, he may have wanted to also uh, remain close to uh, Lord Dunsany. Um, that, that's my only suggestion, perhaps, that that was part of it. But although Dunsany, uh, in fairness to Dunsany, Dunsany tried to, tried to persuade him not to sign up. He felt he was too good a poet, too good a literary man to risk uh, his life, and that 
he should stay at home and write poems instead. But, but Ledwidge didn't, didn't go along with that and joined against the wishes of Dunsany, uh, it would seem. But I have no, I've no, no evidence to suggest, but I'm, I'm, I'm just surmising from the, the short space of time between this fervent display of nationalist sentiment on the one hand and then signing up five days later to a British regiment. I'm not sure that he went through the normal calculation that you might expect someone to go through if they were planning this for a bit longer. Thank you, Dan. I see somebody in the audience does have an answer to that question, but perhaps first we'll take... Uh, do you want to just do that very briefly, then, before we take Professor Roy Foster? Um, no, Lord Dunsany's uh, son, Lord Dunsany, who's now also passed away, actually told me that he, after, the, after his father had tried to persuade Francis Ledwidge not to join up, he actually found him somebody who he told was a great poet and to protect him from the battlefield. But, of course, ultimately it didn't work out that way. It was just an interesting yeah, little anecdote. Sure, sure, yeah. Thanks. Um, I'd like to thank Dan Mulhall not only for a very thought-provoking paper and for reminding us that there are centenaries like the Irish Convention and Ledger's death, which we should be noting, but I'd also like to thank him for all he's done as ambassador in London for those, those of us who are Irish living in England appreciated it, and I hope he knows that. Um, Dan, the question that you've raised and that's come up in the questions about Ledger's surprising enigmatic, in Heaney's words, signing up. Um, it's my impression that the volunteers were honeycombed and riven apart well before the First World War broke out because there was a faction that was uh, interpenetrated by the IRB, a classic case of entryism, and these, of course, this, of course, is the core of the people who planned the rising. And then there was the majority who were Redmondites. It's my impression, too, that after the Wooden Bridge speech, which some people pushed Redmond to make, they wanted him to actually accentuate, bring out into the open that split within the volunteers. And it's my impression that after Wooden Bridge and the many discussions in local volunteer groups, that some people who were passionate nationalists but also loyal to Redmond were very shocked to find the degree of entryism the IRB had managed to bring about and possibly Ledwidge's reaction to joining up and supporting Redmond by so doing was because he had come to realize just how honeycombed the volunteers had been by those IRB elements with whom I think, and I, here I'd like to hear your opinion, with whom I think he wouldn't have been in complete agreement. He was certainly a passionate nationalist. I doubt, in spite of his friendship with MacDonald and others, if he was a member of the IRB. Yeah, a couple of years ago, Roy, I, I, I published a piece uh, in The Guardian about the two Thomases, um, Thomas McDonough and Tom Kettle. And in that, I made the point that, um, that those were two men who were roughly the same age, who had a very similar background. I mean, Kettle came from a slightly a better, I mean, a more prosperous family. But they both went to good Irish schools, um, uh, Rockwell in, in um, McDonough's case and Clongos in Kettle's case. They both went to, uh, eventually, uh, to UCD um, and both ended up as lecturers in UCD. And it struck me at the time that the two of them divided in 1914. Until then, their lives had been entirely parallel. And they divided. McDonough went the, with the minority and uh, ended up signing the proclamation, joined the IRB only in the last uh, weeks of his life, I think, um, and Kettle went off and was killed on the Western Front. And it struck me that that, 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 that moment in 1914 when the war broke out was one of the kind of turning points in Irish history because, if you like, a lot of things came together then. You had the kind of... The, the growth of a more radical cultural nationalism. You had um, the, um, you know, the IRB getting going again, being more effective with Tom Clark and McDermott operating uh, around the country and building up their strength and, and infiltrating the various organizations that were available to be infiltrated. Um, and it struck me that between McDonough and Kettle, you know, it must have been a fairly tight call as to, and in fact, 
the reason why Kettle ended up going the way he did, not because he wasn't a passion. I mean, Kettle, I actually found a quote from Kettle saying, I would support a revolution in Ireland if it were practical. So it wasn't that he had any lack of belief in, in the, Ireland's right to independence, but he simply had that view that it was not practical. He was a, well, the younger generation of parliamentary nationalists who, who, uh, who did lean a bit more towards the, uh, the radical end of the spectrum, being a younger man. But ultimately, it was, his, it was his devotion to the Irish party. It was that tradition that he belonged to that brought him uh, to side with Redmond and to fight and die on, on the Western Front. In Ledwidge's case, I think that... Uh, I mean, my own sense is that he, he took very seriously the whole idea of the First World War as a battle between a particular set of values which were shared between Britain and Ireland, ultimately, and a kind of different set of values that were represented by the German Empire in particular. And that that was something that, you know, that weighed heavily on him. Because I was struck by that, what he said at the Navan Rural District Council when he was in the minority, arguing, defending himself and the, those who went against Redmond. He said, I am not a pro-German. I'm an anti-German and I'm an Irishman. So I think he, he quite genuinely had a passionate belief in the need to, to stand up and do more than passing resolutions. I don't know whether he had any connection with the IRB. I don't know if the IRB was active in County Meath, for example, because it seems from what I've read that you know, only a handful of volunteers in, the, in Ledwidge's branch, of which he was secretary, by the way, in Slane, uh, went against Redmond. So it doesn't sound to me from that indication that the IRB were particularly effective or active in the Slane area. So that may well be one of the reasons why Ledwidge uh, decided ultimately to opt to sign up for, for service in the First World War. But I do think that he was clearly stung by the accusations made against him by his fellow members of the Rural Council that he was somehow a pro-German coward trying to shirk his responsibilities towards the civilization that um, the war was supposed to be defending. Great. Listen, thank you very much, Dan. I know there are further questions, but I'm afraid time is against us, so we might continue the discussion over lunch. Thanks again.